Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, let me give you a couple prayer requests and uh, then we'll open in prayer and uh, look into the word tonight. Uh, next uh, Wednesday night is our bi-monthly business meeting. And uh, so we've got some projects to update you on, some other projects that uh, we're anticipating. So I encourage you and challenge you to be in your place on Wednesday. Then also Monday, Mary Lepton had successful knee surgery, so we're thankful for that, but continue to pray for her. Also, I mentioned Sunday, continue to pray for the family of Fred Barrett. Uh, Fred passed away last week, and I prayed to Orton here for uh, several years. My understanding, it was here actually for the 250th anniversary 10 years ago, and played the organ for us that day, but uh, Fred passed away, so continue to pray for his family. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 110. Psalm 110, refer to this psalm several times as we've been looking at the high priestly ministry of uh, Jesus Christ and uh, some truths we've referred to before, but I want to kind of pull things together tonight, make some application uh, if we can. So let me read the psalm and then I'll pray, then we'll uh, draw some principles out, uh, Lord willing. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast to do with thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings of the day in his wrath, shall judge among the heathen, he shall fill the places with the dead bodies, shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook and the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your ministry tonight. Uh, we realize and appreciate your ministry as a faithful high priest, but we also realize your, your role as king in our lives. The hymn writer said it so well, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. And so, Father, I challenge us as we look into this passage. We pray that you open our hearts and minds to what you have to say to us. We pray, help us to apply your truth to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. We realize it's vitally important to have a right perspective in situations and circumstances. And uh, uh, a wrong approach to things can be, can be very fatal. And uh, the story is told of Abraham Lincoln when he was shot in 1865 that typically doctors would treat uh, individuals by uh, draining some blood, and they thought that would help the situation. But obviously, with uh, President Lincoln, because of the wound that he suffered, uh, it led to his led to his death. And uh, so it, they had a wrong approach to that situation, and uh, things didn't uh, obviously worked out according to God's plan, but not according to their uh, desire. But it's also vitally important for us to have the right approach to Scripture. And um, the right approach to who uh, Jesus Christ is. And uh, uh, Jesus uh, talked to Peter in Matthew chapter 16 and, and addressed the situation. Who do men say that I am? And then uh, Peter says, uh, Jesus asking, uh, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter gives the right confession out to Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God. So it's essential for us to have a proper perspective of Christ. And, and we would realize our perspective and, and understand, as we've discussed the last several weeks, uh, his position as high priest and as ministry as high priest. We also realize, as we'll see tonight, he's uh, king as well. And uh, we should never come to the point in our life where uh, we figure we've, we've got it all figured out, nothing more for us to learn. But yet, as we continue to seek the Lord and continue to grow in his word, uh, we should be able to learn things that uh, change our, our minds, our perspective, so we have the right perspective as to who he is. It, it, it can be, uh, we realize uh, we can be very arrogant at times to say, you know what, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know that I need to learn anything else. I, 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 I've got a handle on it. We would never be foolish enough to make that statement, but yet um, we realize at times we can uh, even have the perspective of the Pharisees. You know, they... Uh, they had a wrong thinking about who Jesus was. Um, uh, when it came to the Messiah, particularly, uh, the word, the Hebrew word Messiah means anointed one. Uh, the Greek word Christ is from the Hebrew word and means anointed one as well. So uh, Christ was anointed of God and, and, uh, 
And the, the Pharisees knew that Jesus uh, was going to be a descendant of David. And so um, really when they looked at Psalm 110, it, it really left them in, in somewhat of a quandary uh, trying to recognize and acknowledge just who uh, Jesus was. They realized he would come from David, but they thought that he would come uh, and set up his earthly kingdom and, and they would be part of that and, and, and life would be good. And, and uh, yet they didn't realize that Jesus Christ as a Messiah was the second person of the Trinity, both God and man. And so uh, they, they wrestled with that and they were challenged by that. Uh, in fact, if you turn back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, we find Jesus quoting verse 1 of Psalm 10. In Matthew chapter 22, in verse 42, uh, Jesus says, saying, talking to the Pharisees, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he a son? And, and uh, they, they couldn't answer that question. Um, they, uh, they were really short-sighted and short-minded on, on the answer to that question. How could the Messiah be David's son and also be David's Lord? And uh, so Jesus was, uh, was challenging them because if he was David's son, they would understand that. But if he was David's Lord, then that would make them responsible to him. And they just, uh, they just weren't willing to acknowledge that or bow their knee at, at that point. Uh, but uh, it's important for us to make sure that we have a correct understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do and, and what he's doing here and now. You know, there are times when I think we may have a, a, a wrong perspective of Jesus. We may almost have a pharisaical uh, expectation. And, and people today can think, okay, if Christ comes and I place my faith and trust in him, then life's going to be great and life's going to work out the way that I want it and think it should. And, and uh, yet we realize, what did Jesus come to do? He came to give us certainly a perfect example so we could live like him and be like him. Uh, but he's living, he's doing something here and now as well, uh, allowing the Spirit of God to do the work of God to conform us to the image of God uh, in, in our lives. And, and realizing we must completely and daily submit to him in every area so that, that uh, the, the purpose of God, the plan of God is, is performed in our life. When we come to that point to understand why he came, it really helps us overcome some of the other difficulties and obstacles and challenges. It gives us a right perspective. I've talked before about in the illustration how vitally important it is to have the right perspective on situations and circumstances of life. As we have the correct perspective of Jesus Christ, it will, in fact, impact every area of our life. When we have the right perspective, even when we don't understand situations, we will, by faith, uh, come to the point and, and recognize our need to trust him as Lord. And so uh, when we look at Psalm 110, we realize that Psalm 110 is totally messianic in its outlook and its perspective. Uh, the, the superscription said the Psalm of David. And David typically, you know, we think of the Psalms as giving kind of a background and a little bit of what's going on in David's life and what he learned about God and in a situation, we really don't find any circumstantial issues here, but we do find much of the revealing of the character of God and and, and helping us understand, you know, just who uh, Jesus Christ is, particularly as we look at verse 4 in relation to uh, the comparison to Melchizedek. Uh, one Puritan expositor said this, uh, this psalm contains this in seed form the, the entire Apostles' Creed, and and our responsibility is stated in succinct little uh, phrases that help us understand uh, what we are to do. Uh, but we also realize Psalm 110 is the most frequently quoted passage in the Old Testament, quoted in the New Testament. And so uh, there are three truths that we want to see tonight. First of all, we want to see that Jesus 
the Messiah is king of the earth. We see that in verses 1 through 3. Uh, verse 1 and verse 4 are, are very interesting to me. There's a conversation between the Godhead, between two of the members of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son. And uh, uh, we will see that. And, and first of all, in verse 1, we see the person of the Messiah King is both God and man. The Lord said unto my Lord. Now, again, I talked about the Pharisees having a perspective of the Messiah. And uh, they knew he would be a physical descendant of David. And uh, so he would be a man. But they didn't grasp the full import of what David was saying here in Psalm 110. So I'm sure Psalm 110 uh, really put them in a quandary about who, who the Messiah is. And uh, the Messiah would be David's son, but he would also be David's Lord. And, you know, in their mind, how would that work out? And, and what would that look like? Um, and, and they couldn't they couldn't reconcile those differences. And so therefore they rejected Christ for for who he was. It's interesting when we go back to Matthew 22 that when Jesus is quoting Psalm 110, he's he's putting a stamp of authority on on the Old Testament and uh, the Davidic authorship of uh, of Psalm 110. And uh, uh, Jesus believed that Scripture, obviously, Jesus believed that Scripture was was divinely inspired, and uh, yet. Uh, if you turn back to Mark chapter 12, we find Mark's account of this um, of this event, Jesus' confrontation uh, with the Pharisees. Mark chapter 12. Notice you would verse 36, and notice the members of the Trinity here that are referred to. Mark chapter 12 and verse 36, For David himself said, By the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If you look um, the word Lord there in, in Mark um, 12, 36 is, is the word for Jehovah. Uh, Lord is, is Adonai, or Kyrios. And, uh, and, and so we see the uh, the reference there and, and the necessity of understanding uh, who Jesus Christ is. Uh, one of the challenges and uh, one of the things that we need to learn and we can apply from these scriptures is, is to understand that uh, the cults have a, a real misconception of, of who Jesus Christ is and, uh, and they stumble over the same things that the Pharisees did. And so uh, when they come to your door, you know, the first question we ought to ask is, who do you say Jesus Christ is? And if it's anything other than the Son of God, uh, then, then there's a problem with their theology. And so uh, we realize from back in our text in Psalm 110 that uh, the, the person of the Messiah King is both God and man. But then we also see the position of the Messiah King He's exalted at the right hand of God. We see that in the middle part of verse 1. And uh, after Christ's crucifixion, after his resurrection three days later, after his ascension 40 days later, which is actually, was actually last Thursday, was Ascension Day, uh, Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And Paul says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And so he's in an exalted position. And uh, as a result of that, he sent the Holy Spirit to his followers in order to empower them, to enable them to carry out the task that, uh, that he had entrusted to them. And in uh, passages such as Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Mark 16, 15, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And uh, so uh, we, we notice and, and we see that they were enabled by the power of the Holy Ghost, and Mark refers to the Holy Ghost in his um, record of this same account in Mark chapter 12, and um, yet we we realize that uh, Jesus' ascension into heaven also had the, the contained the promised outpouring of of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Uh, Luke says that God hath 
that made uh, the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord, Kyrios, and Christ, uh, Messiah. And so uh, verse 1 of Psalm 110 uh, looks at the present time, Jesus, where Jesus is presently and at the right hand of the Father. We'll go back to our text in Psalm 110. We see that this power is demonstrated through his people, and, and we see that specifically in verse 3. But verse 2 tells us, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion to rule in the midst of thine enemies. Um, the idea here is that his Lord's strength wouldn't just be manifested and revealed in his people, but um, it would extend to the entire world, it would rule over all in the midst of his enemies. And uh, so it wasn't just Christ as king of the Jews, but Christ the king of all, and he will eventually rule over the over all. And we realize um, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We look in verse 3 when, uh, I'm sorry, the first part of verse 2, uh, the rod of thy strength, writer Adam Clark, commentator Adam Clark, written extensively, says that uh, the rod of thy strength represents the gospel. And we realize that the gospel, is, is the word of God is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And the gospel is the power of God and salvation. So we see the, the power that's there. We also notice the last part of verse 3, and there's some question about uh, just exactly what, what David is saying here. Uh, some translations say say this and record this as uh, your youth or to you as the dew or first the strength or the or the youth of the splendor the dew of, of those in Messiah's army uh, but um, others would say that thou as the dew of thy earth refers to the Messiah he never loses his strength or glory and certainly that is that is true he, he's not weary he doesn't get tired like we do and uh, so David makes sure that wants to make sure that we understand that Jesus Christ is King of the Earth. He was the God Man. He was crucified. He was resurrected. He's exalted. Right hand of the Father. We also see in verse four there's a second truth, and that is this: uh, the the Messiah is the eternal Priest of the Earth. Uh, and, and again, the the conversation continues. The Lord has sworn. And so this, this conversation between God the Father and God the Son uh, continues. And, and we realize the Lord, he will not repent. He will not change his mind and as a result change his action. We'll see this uh, in Jonah chapter 3, Lord willing, on Sunday night. We'll talk about the Lord repenting. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean he sinned, but he, he acts in, uh, he changes his actions in, in, as a result of man's response. And so... Um, we, we see that as uh, David says, the Lord has sworn, uh, when the Lord swears by something, he wants people to make sure they pay attention. And uh, what, what do they want us to pay attention to? What does he want us to pay attention to? Well, we find in the middle part of verse 4, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we've noted the numerous references uh, to Melchizedek, somewhat of a mysterious character in Scripture, but I believe it's a... Um, it's a, it's a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and uh, we'll see that and refer back to that in just a minute. But uh, Melchizedek, we looked at last Wednesday night, uh, is mentioned in Genesis 14, here in Psalm 110, uh, Hebrews 5, verse 6, Hebrews 5, verse 10, Hebrews 7, verse 1, verse 10, verse 11, 15, 17, 21. So he's a, a prominent character of, of Hebrews chapter 7. We noted last week, Melchizedek in Hebrew means king of righteousness, and uh, he was the king of Salem, and realized that righteousness made the application of righteousness is the only source of true peace. To be righteously related to the God of heaven is the only way we can have peace with him. But uh, we noted briefly last week you know, from Genesis 14 that, that Melchizedek kind of appears out of nowhere, um, and uh, he, he refreshes Abraham with bread and wine after he's rescued Lot. And uh, made reference last week, you know, I'm not sure that, that we would have been willing to rescue Lot after uh, everything that Lot had done. But be that as it may, uh, Abraham rescued him. Uh, he received Melchizedek, 
I believe it's a type of Christ received a tithe of Abraham's spoils of the battle, bringing Lot back and uh, his family as well. Uh, he's called a priest of the Most High God, and uh, he acts as a mediator between God and Abraham, um, and he gives God's blessing to Abraham and uh, in order to receive those tithes from Abraham. And, and so again, we see Melchizedek as a, as a type of Christ. Uh, and so the writer of the book of Hebrews, as we've noted, was writing to a group of second generation Jewish Christians who were tempted to go back to the Old Testament law. And, and uh, so they would go back to Abraham. And, and uh, yet uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews helping these uh, second generation believers uh, see the importance and the superiority of Christ uh, so they did not go back to, uh, to Judaism. Uh, and so... Uh, we, we find the writer of the book of Hebrews it's his, in his reference to Melchizedek and, and uh, referring back to, to Psalm 110 and verse 4 as well. But the, the, the issue is, and, and what we need to recognize, is Melchizedek was superior to the, to the Levitical priesthood, but uh, and he was not superior to Christ. And, and we realize that Christ is superior to the Jewish kings uh, in that when we look at at verse 1, we see of Psalm 110, we see the, the kingly nature of Christ, his enemies uh, sitting at his footstool. And, and uh, so we see not only Jesus Christ as priest after the order of Melchizedek, we see him as king as well. Uh, he's an eternal priest, but he's better than a priest. The, the, the Israelite kings could not be, I'm sorry, the Israelite king could not be priest, nor could the priest be king. And so Christ being both was superior to both. And uh, he didn't need to offer the sacrifice. Uh, he, was, he was sinless. We, we noted you know, the high priest once a year had to offer uh, sacrifices for, own, for his own sin before he could offer sins for the, uh, for the people. And uh, we recognize Hebrews 7 uh, tells us in verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost to come unto God, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, and so uh, we we recognize that Jesus is not just a, a priest, but he's God in the flesh, and as such, he is our our King. And so we must understand and have the proper perspective. Again, we'll go back to the illustration to begin the message tonight uh, to to understand the importance of, of perspective. He's he's the King of the earth. He's the eternal priest of the earth, according to verse 4, but he's also the future judge of the earth. Uh, we, we see in verses 5 through 7 the scene shifting from the throne to the battlefield, the, the battle that's been going on uh, since Genesis 3 between God and Satan, and, and he will eventually, uh, Christ will eventually rule and, and reign forever. Verse 5 uh, deals with that, and uh, uh, we, we see, if, if we look at verse 5, the, the order is reversed. The Lord at thy right hand. Uh, verse 1 tells us, uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. So the positions between father and son are reversed. And we see here, uh, as, the, as the father's at the right hand of the son, the father is providing the power uh, for the son uh, at, at the right hand. And so, um, we see the judgment that's coming, and uh, even as Jesus was trying to communicate this uh, to the Pharisees back in Matthew 22, he, he was continually addressing their issues, helping them see the judgment was coming. And uh, there's going to be a judgment on Gentile nations. Just a short while later, in Matthew 25, Jesus would talk about the judgment on the Gentile nation. And we realize that after the tribulation, there will be a thousand years where Christ will reign, the millennial reign of Christ, and it'll be the final great white throne judgment. And uh, the dead in Christ will be raised. I'm sorry, the, the dead apart from Christ will be raised, and, and those who rejected him will be uh, cast into hell for all eternity. And, and yet we see that, that verse 7 tells us that there's a poetic way of communicating what Christ would do. Uh, Messiah will carry out his judgment very swiftly, and uh, yet, we realize that often in the pursuit of battle, 
the, the, the participants in the battle become weary and uh, they get thirsty. And, and so the psalmist here, David, I believe was writing from, from personal experience, remembering times when he was on the run or, or perhaps times when he was chasing the enemy that he would get thirsty and, and he would need to be refreshed. There was a period of time where he, he longed for water from the well of Jerusalem. And, and uh, yet when someone volunteered to do that, he said, no, you don't risk your life for me for that. But um, we find the, the, uh, this description of Christ stopping to drink by the brook and uh, being refreshed and then continuing to pursue his enemies till his enemies are totally destroyed. None will escape. We realize now is a time of God withholding his, his judgment, his full and total judgment on, on lost mankind, those that choose to reject him. But there is a time when uh, God, the time of God's long suffering and his patience will, will end and that judgment and that justice will be meted out. And uh, we, we can be thankful that we won't be the recipients. If we've known Christ as our Savior, trust him as our Savior, we don't have to worry about the great white throne judgment, but we do need to realize uh, the reality that as as believers, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not that we'll suffer punishment, but as we said, uh, there will be a loss of reward because of our lack of diligence and our service for, for the king. So uh, our perspective is vitally important, and our perspective will uh, determine how we live. We need to see Jesus Christ as our king and uh, not just occasional, not just when a king tells us to do what we want to do anyway, but uh, our, the necessity for complete and total obedience. We also realize that he's our eternal priest. He's also the future judge of the earth. I'm always challenged when I consider that concept. You know, if I believe that, and I do, then it will motivate me to share the good news of the gospel so that those I come in contact with, neighbors, friends, loved ones, will be aware of, of the coming judgment. So th there are three implications from this psalm, three applications we can make. Number one, since Jesus is king, we should, su we should submit to his lordship willingly. You know, we realize even Isaiah said in Isaiah 45, verse 23, then unto me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. God says it's going to happen. Paul deals with that same concept. You either bow the knee now or you'll bow the knee later. And uh, yet, again, the application for us as believers, we're not always obedient, but we need to have that mindset uh, of being ready to obey. And, and when we don't, to confess it and deal with it and, and not be like Jonah, you know, that's been such a challenge to me. Did Jonah end up doing what God wanted him to do? Yeah, but it's kind of like the little boy that got in trouble one time. Mom made him go sit in the corner. He said, you know what? I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And uh, you know, we can obey from the outside, but are we really obeying from the heart, really bowing our knee from our heart? And, and there's a growing submission that once we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there should be a uh, a, a growing submission to him. There's a second truth. Since Jesus is our priest, we should, we should apply that mediation gladly. We should go to him and be willing to go to him. And, and uh, prayer should be our first response rather than our last resort. Um, he, he's our go-between. Um, he's our once for all. You know, the sacrifice was paid once for all. And uh, when we sin, we have an advocate because of that once for all forgiveness, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, John tells us, leaving 1 John chapter 2. And uh, what, a, what a blessing. You know, I, uh, I think of that advocate, that lawyer, one who argues our case before God, presents the evidence. All the evidence he needs is, is, is the prints of the nails in his hand and, and the, the scars in his feet and the spear scar in the side. You know, this is the, the, the evidence that I love. And my blood was shed for those who... Who I'm interceding on behalf of, Jesus Christ says. And so uh, I'm thankful that, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 4, that the writer tells us, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we can be thankful he's interceding for us. What a blessed thought that is. What a, what a concept. Jesus is praying for us. A great preacher of days gone by, Robert Murray McShane, said this, If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. What a thought because of the promises of Scripture. The third thought is, since Jesus is a judge, we should avoid his chastening fearfully. Now, we need to recognize God chastens his children. God disciplines his children. In the writer of the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, it says, no chastening for the present seems joyous. Okay. In fact, uh, let's go back there to Hebrews chapter 12. It, 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 and we noted this, Quite a while back, I think, when we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, we looked at chastening. And typically, we think of chastening as, as, uh, as corporal punishment of one kind or another. Chastening is, is, is harsh. But yet, the rather big of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, says, Now, chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Not a fun time. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The idea there is... The, the, the chastening is instructive. It, it's corrective. It's not, it is to a sense discipline, but not discipline for the sake of discipline, but discipline for the sake of correction. And uh, so what's challenging now has fruit later on. What a, what a blessed thought that is. So when we look at Psalm, Psalm 10, we realize, or Psalm 110, we realize that Jesus is king, we should submit to him. Jesus is priest, we should draw near to him. Jesus is coming judge, we are on, he is on our side and uh, interceding for us. What a blessed thought that is. So may this be an encouragement to us to realize, make sure we have the proper perspective of who Jesus Christ is. So Lord willing, we will see you Sunday morning and uh, have a great rest of the week.